वेलकम एवरी वन आई एम एक्साइटेड टू इंट्रोड्यूस आर न्यू नेक्स्ट स्टॉक ऑन एक्सेसिबिलिटी टेस्टिंग एट स्केल पावर्ड बाय एपियम प्रेजेंटेड बाय टू इनक्रेडिबल स्पीकर्स रेजल यू एंड प्रोडक्ट ओनर फॉर एक्स डेव टूल्स मोबिल एट डी क्यू सिस्टम्स एन सी एंड मार्किस मेडल डायरेक्टर ऑफ टेक्निकल सर्विस एट सॉस एप्स Uh, Rachel brings expertise in mobile accessibility testing while Marcus a leader in technical services will offer valuable insights into scaling accessibility efforts using APM. We are thrilled to have you both here today to share uh, your knowledge and experiences with us. Without further delay over to you Rachel and Marcus. So welcome everybody to accessibility testing at scale powered by APM today at our APM conference 2024. So Just a little bit more about Marcus and I. Um, as as uh, Sadant mentioned, I'm the product owner for Access Tools Mobile. Um, so I started my journey in accessibility over five years ago as actually a web developer, um, developing the web dashboard for viewing results of automated accessibility scans of native mobile apps. Um, so I had this really cool experience of learning both mobile app accessibility and web accessibility at the same time, and kind of grew into the product owner role. Um, but my passion really lies in in mobile accessibility, so I'm excited to talk about it to you today. So, Marcus, let's hear from you a little bit. Thanks. Uh, I'm uh, Marcus Merrill. I'm, I'm I work at Sauce Labs as a principal technical advisor, and uh, I, I uh, I've been in quality assurance 25 years. I've been in web testing, mobile testing for uh, basically, I mean, kind of as long as they've existed. But I I found accessibility three four years ago when my colleague Manoj Kumar, our keynote speaker, uh, I saw him doing talks about accessibility and listening to the content of those, and I started to started to really uh, understand how important it was and what what a what a good thing it was to try to build a more inclusive and open web uh, as we as we uh, you know move through this crazy world and try to address the fifteen percent of users who do require assistive technology in order to be able to use use the web. Uh, I mean, think about someone who. Um, trying to pay a toll and there's only one one government of California and you try to pay a toll and it doesn't work because the software is not accessible you're in trouble so that's what kind of sparked my interest is that kind of thing the 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 inability of some folks to be able to access what they need to do so uh, I'm really excited to be here really privileged to uh, to be speaking especially with with Rachel uh, they're a tireless advocate and I'm very and much enjoy uh, working with them thank you Yeah, thank you Marcus. I I very much enjoy working with you as well. We've been working together for several years now since um DQ yeah. and and Sauce Labs came together with a partnership. So, excited to great. bring this presentation to life today. Um so let's go ahead and dive right in. So, first of all, I'm going to set the stage and let you discuss what what is accessibility testing for those of us who may not know. Um but before even diving into that, let's first talk about what is a disability. So, the CDC um describes a disability as a condition of the body or mind in parentheses impairment that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities activity limitation in parentheses and interact with the world around them participation restrictions so this definition is is pretty dense um and it it is rooted in what we we talk about as the medical model of disability there's kind of two models the medical model and the social model Um and so this definition is really rooted in the medical model where it kind of puts the onus of the disability on the person as though the person has some sort of defect or a problem because they are disabled um whereas I prefer to think of it in the social model um where it's more of like our society has not been built to accommodate all of the differences in humans in the world that we have um so a more uh, a definition that I like to think about disability is as um the prefix dis doesn't need to have a negative connotation um one of the meanings of the prefix is actually to twain which quite literally uh de is defined as in different directions so when we're thinking it, about it in that way disability doesn't mean someone is um missing an ability or they lack an ability it just means they have a uh, different abilities so being disabled does not suggest a lack of anything which is a quote from Lawrence Carter Long Um and as we were prepping this uh presentation Marcus um brought up another good example of kind of the difference between disinterested and uninterested um uninterested meaning you are like actively not interested in in the whatever the activity or item is um whereas disinterested is more more of a neutral you're just not you're not actively uninterested um so I really enjoyed that perspective as well thank you Marcus 
So now that we kind of um, have an understanding of disability as a whole, I want to break it down and talk about different types of disabilities and impairments. Um, so we have kind of one category of different ways that the disability affects the person. So it may be visual or hearing or speaking um, or cognitive. And then more in recent years, we've had we've talked about this concept of neurodiver der, neurodivergency. So um, people's brains just operating in different ways and also mobile or morbidity, mobile or uh, sorry, mobility or motor impairments as well. So um, physical disabilities where maybe you can't um, move your hands as, as um, quickly or just various mobile uh, mobility disorders. Um, and then we talk about disability in three different ways um, as for how it affects the person um, uh, time-wise, I guess I would say. So it can either be a permanent disability, so something that the person has for their entire life, or a temporary disability. Um, think about you know someone who breaks a bone um, and can't use their arm for a, X amount of weeks or months. That would be considered a temporary disability or impairment. And then also we think about situational. So even um, maybe you're in a room where there's a lot of other people talking and you can't focus on the conversation that you're having right now because of the situation that you're in. Or you're a, um, you're a parent who works from home and you have a kiddo distracting you and you're trying to you know, hold your kiddo but still work and you only have one hand. Um, just really highlighting how disability, I believe, impacts everyone at some point in their life or another. Um, and I have a graphic here on the screen just with concentric circles of graphics of, um, or illustrations of different types of things that relate to accessibility and disability um, and different people and assistive technologies. So now that we understand a lot more about uh, disability, how does, that, uh, how does that apply to the digital world? What does digital accessibility mean? So digital, digital accessibility is the practice of building digital content such as web and mobile apps in a way that allows access for everyone, regardless of any disabilities. So this can cover a wide range of concepts, such as screen reader support, captioning videos, and color schemes. So just an, a small note that uh, on what a screen reader is, for those who may not be familiar, it's an assistive technology that allows someone who has a visual impairment to interact with their screen using audio. So the, 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 the technology will read out the content of the screen and allow the user to interact with it. Um, then I also throw on here that A11Y, some people pronounce that as ally or ally, is called a numerum um, for accessibility. So there are 11 letters between the first letter A and the last letter Y. So this might be a terminology that you see thrown around when you're um, looking at things uh, for digital accessibility. And then as Marcus pointed out, um, I think you quoted 15%. I've got a, a, a um, statistic here from the World Health Organization that an estimated 1.3 billion people experience significant disability, which represents 16% of the population in the world, or one in six of us. So now that we really are, are understanding digital accessibility, disability, and why that's important, what about mobile specifically? So there are uh, more than 6.5 billion smartphone users worldwide, which is just predicted to continue increasing as it has over the past decade. And then um, WebAIM does an annual screen reader uh, survey. And in the most recent one, 90% of those screen reader users responded that they use a mobile device. So nearly all people who use a screen reader are using a screen reader on a mobile device, so an iPhone or an Android device. Um, but it's not all about screen readers. That's kind of the most common thing that people think about when it comes to digital accessibility, but there's a lot more than that. Um, for example, a lot of folks who are in a wheelchair will mount a tablet to their wheelchair. So I have a picture here of two individuals who are interacting um, via a tablet that's mounted to one of those person's wheelchairs. So now that we're understanding that digital accessibility and is, is important for mobile apps and mobile devices, um, let's talk about different guidelines that can help us build more accessible uh, digital experiences. So the first is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is authored by the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C. Um, it's often referred to uh, by its acronym WCAG, or I like to say WCAG. Um, and this is the most widely adopted 
um, kind of the gold standard of digital accessibility guidelines, but it is in fact created for the web. Um, so we think about, or sorry, WCAG kind of comes out in versions. So the, the oldest kind of still in use version is 2.0, which was released in December of 2008. And um, just kind of timeline of iOS and Android was that iOS was released in 2007 and Android was released in 2008. So there really wasn't any consideration for iOS or Android whatsoever um, in WCAG 2.0. It just, the timeline didn't, it didn't exist. <laughs> so they couldn't think about it because it wasn't a thing. <laughs> Um, so then about 10 years later down the line, we had WCAG 2.1 come out, which is an additive release. So that means everything that was in 2.0 is also in 2.1, but some more criteria was added. And some of those criteria did focus on mobile, um, because obviously within the 10 years between 2008 and 2020 or er, um, 2018, mobile gained a lot of popularity. Um, it became, you know, everyone, that's that's the, the time when everyone started buying mobile phones. Everyone has a, a smartphone in their pocket now. Um, and so there was a few criteria added with a mobile focus. And then again, in October of 2023, so last year, about a year ago now, WCAG 2.2 came out. So kind of same thing, some more additional criteria were added. Um, and WCAG 3.0 is a kind of a reimagining of the guidelines as a whole, which is underway, but expected to be a good ways out still. Um, then, aside from the versions, we also have levels for WCAG. So each version has, um, or each criteria has a certain level associated with it. So we have A, AA, and AAA, where AA is seen as the standard. Um, that's what everyone kind of is agreed upon adhering to. Um, and then A is more like, like a bare minimum. Um, it's, it's not even, you're not even really meeting the standard. And then AAA is considered extra credit. So talking a little bit more about guidelines and how it transitions into the legal landscape, um, because in the US at least, um, WCAG is, is the widely adopted standard for the legal, um, the, in, in the law. So whenever there's a lawsuit uh, about digital accessibility, it's gonna point back to WCAG. Um, so there are two task force at two task, two different task force on the W3C um, that work on making WCAG kind of make sense for mobile because as I mentioned, it was designed with HTML content uh, and, and the ARIA spec in mind. Um, whereas mobile apps are built in Swift or Kotlin, we don't have CSS and HTML. Um, it's a fundamentally different underlying technology. So there's things in the guidance that really doesn't make sense because it's telling you to you know set a certain ARIA property that doesn't exist or uh, be, you know, an X amount of CSS pixels, but you don't know what a CSX pixel is in a mobile app. <laughs> um, so there's there's two task force at the W3C working on this. There's the Mobile Accessibility Task Force, um, which has historically focused a bit more on mobile web. So when I say mobile web, I'm talking about web content rendered in like Safari or Chrome on your iPhone or Android device. And then um, mobile native, native mobile apps um, are that native content, Swift UI, Jetpack Compose, et cetera. Um, so the Mobile Accessibility Task Force in the past was more focused on mobile web, um, but in the last year, a new leader has joined and has focused more on native mobile. However, this task force doesn't have a lot of power, so they are able to create kind of their own standalone document, um, but it's, it's actually quite unlikely that that standalone document would get adopted into the legal, um, the legal side of things. So, it's kind of like a guidance that doesn't have a whole lot of legal weight. The other task force is the WCAG 2 ICT task force, which um, ICT stands for Information Communication Technology. So this task force is more broad than just mobile. It also includes uh, desktop apps, kiosks, PDF, et cetera. Um, but they have a little bit more power because they're, they're able to add notes to actual WCAG. So once their, their project is published, it will actually be in WCAG, which does um, then funnel through into the legal stuff. So it will have more legal weight, but it will be less specific to mobile because it has to encompass those other technologies, essentially encompass all non-web technologies. Um, so aside from the W3C and WCAG, we also have accessibility guidance from Apple and Google themselves. So there's recommendations in Apple's human interface guidelines 
and Android has a developer accessibility guide. Um, these provide great advice on how to make accessible apps for Apple or for iOS and Google, or sorry, Android. However, they don't have any legal weight um, whatsoever. Um, so those are more just kind of floating out there and some people follow them, um, but it doesn't, doesn't uh, have any impact on compliance when it comes to the legal side of things. So moving on now, um, as I mentioned, WCAG is the standard for uh, the, the United States. However, the EU has their own standards. So it's called EN301549, which is largely based on WCAG 2.1 level AA. Um, but it also incorporates a few other criteria for mobile that is lacking from WCAG. So in addition to things not quite lining up because of the difference between the underlying technologies, um, there's also things in, in features in mobile apps for accessibility that don't exist in the web. So those guidelines don't exist in, in, in WCAG. Um, so the EN301549 aimed to add some extra guidelines to uh, incorporate that and compensate for that. Um, however, there was no legal um, impact of the EN301549 as much until the European Accessibility Act, um, which we will talk about in depth now. So the European Accessibility Act is, is coming along. It was published in 2019, um, and it's accessibility le legislation for digital products and services in all 27 EU member states, and it is effective June 28th. 2025. So that's less than a year from now. Um, and all enterprises within any of the 27 EU member states are, um, you know, need, need to adhere to this, this act, as well as any global enterprise that are selling products or services in the EU. So the time is ticking um, that uh, in, in the EU, uh, there will be repercussions if your con digital content is not accessible. So talking a little bit more about what that looks like and what you need to know about the EAA. Um, all support services need to be accessible. So this is things like your support desks, your chats, um, calling in for, for support, as well as information about your service needs to be readily available. So any documentation about your services or products. Um, and then lastly, it will ex it's expected to um, the, have a compliance standard of the EN 301549, as I mentioned, which is including WCAG 2.1 AA. Um, so we will have those extra mobile criteria in there. There's also um, discussions of incorporating the WCAG 2 ICT once that's published. So you can kind of have the option of um, picking either of those standards to adhere to. Um, and then lastly, your program, uh, your accessibility program needs to be sustainable going forward. So it's not like they're going to come in and check once and if you're good, you're good. Um, it needs to, you have to have kind of proof of how you're going to maintain the accessibility of your products and services. So just a peek at what services are covered. It's a, pretty much, you know, anything you can kind of think of in the digital realm. So we have e-commerce, banking services, phone services, websites and mobile application transaction services, electronic tickets, ebook providers, uh, access to audio visual media services, as well as their emergency calls which is 112, similar to 911 in the US. And then products covered. Um, so the physical devices would be computers and operating systems, smartphones and other communication devices, TV equipment related to digital TV services, ATMs, payment terminals, e-books, e-readers, and ticketing and check-in machines as well. So it covers a, a large realm of kind of anything you can think of that someone would interact with uh, as, as a digital service or product. So diving into a few mobile accessibility concepts, we have screen orientation, which is a criteria that was added in 2.1. Um, and I'll read out the, the actual WCAG content there for us. So a, a content should not be restricting its view and operation to a single display orientation, such as portrait or landscape, um, unless a specific display orientation is essential. So important for people with a tablet mounted to their wheelchair in a fixed orientation. So in thinking back to that photo I shared earlier, um, a lot of folks with a, with a wheelchair have a tablet mounted and it's in a fixed orientation. So if your app is, is locked into portrait mode and their tablet happens to be in landscape mode, they're kind of out of luck because all of the content in your app will be sideways. 
Um, so I do have a screenshot here to illustrate that where we have an app in portrait mode uh, where everything looks beautiful and great. And then in landscape mode, nothing has changed. So everything is sideways. Next, we have touch target size and target spacing. So this is a fun one because uh, a lot of different guidelines say different things. So WCAG 2.1 has a criteria, uh, but it's at the level AAA, so a lot of people don't consider it. But it reads that the size of the target of pointer inputs is at least 44 by 44 CSS pixels. So as I mentioned, we don't necessarily have CSS pixels in our mobile apps. So this can translate directly to uh, 44 DP or 44 point for Android and iOS respectively. However, um, Apple and Google both have their own recommendations on this as well. So Apple's human interface guidelines reads, give all controls and interactive elements a hit target that's large enough. For example, on touchscreen devices, a hit target needs to measure at least 44 by 44 point. So this is agreeing with the WCAG AAA standard. Um, however, Google has um, an even stricter standard. So they recommend that each interactive UI element have a focusable area or touch target size of at least 48 by 48 DP. Larger is even better. And so I have an illustration here or a screenshot here of that same application where I highlighted a button um, that's, it's an e-commerce app. So it's kind of a, a heart or favorite button on an item. Um, and I've highlighted that because it's the target size of it is too small. And so this is important for folks who have various um, motor control or, um, or even just thinking about like someone who has a larger finger, right? Um, you're on your mobile device, uh, you know, 44 pixels is, is pretty small, but, um, and, and we wanna prevent people from in, like inadvertently tapping on or activating the, the wrong control because that can lead to a very frustrating experience. So as I mentioned, the criteria in WCAG was level AAA, and that's because the criteria at the AA was only looking for 24 by 24 pixels, which as I mentioned, 44 is already pretty small. So if you think about 24 by 24 on a mobile device, that's, that's really, really tiny to, to make your button tappable. Um, and so with WCAG 2.2, a new criteria was introduced at the um, AA level to kind of account for this. So some sort of middle ground between the just 20, 20, the 24 by 24 or the 44 by 44. Um, so this incorporates uh, the spacing of the, 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 uh, the controls as well. So essentially with the spacing and the size of the control in combination, if that meets the 24 by 24, then your, um, your target is, is an appropriate size and compliant with WCAG. And now I will pass it over to Marcus for shifting accessibility testing left. I think you might be on mute. Let me Marcus. unmute. I should yeah. unmute. I had the my finger poised to hit that button like for twenty solid minutes, and I just uh, just forgot. Um, you know how you know how it happens. It happens to everyone. Um, thank you for that. It, really in depth, really useful. I, I think that you know it's important to understand that if you have customers using your software in Europe, even though your headquarters are in Mumbai or in San Francisco, you are still going to be, uh, you know, on the, on the hook for this regulation. So let's talk about how to do it in a way that is, you know, scalable and makes it doable, possible. So uh, let's go ahead and go into that. Um, I think we've all seen a version of this slide where if you catch a bug early in the process, it saves a lot less, it saves you a lot more money than if it actually goes all the way into production. And I, as I think we saw from a couple of recent um, globally affected software defects that actually made it into production in a very big way, it's 30x is, is, is minuscule compared to the, the effect that it can actually have on your business if it, say, brings down entire airlines or entire uh, you know, categories of businesses because your your software defect, you you couldn't be bothered to test your software well enough to make sure it couldn't handle something like a null pointer exception. Well, the truth is with all of the um, regulations and compliance codes coming towards um, our software in terms of accessibility, the the potential liability you have from a lawsuit and, and the fines from uh, an EAA violation could dwarf the amount of time it would have taken you to just take some consideration early on in the software process and uh, and tests for accessibility there. Um, so let's go to the next one. <clears throat> um, the the other thing about it is that we shouldn't just consider, you know, what what are the what are the 
you know, like we shouldn't just consider we want to avoid uh, because of fear. We should also try to to understand that when you make your software accessible, you are reaching more of an audience, which is not just a morally good thing, but also a a revenue thing. Uh, as we've said, what is sixteen percent? I need to amend my talking point. Sixteen percent of people need this these features, which means that you're if you are able to make your software accessible, you've opened up your audience to sixteen percent uh, higher potential revenue numbers. Uh, but also, it's important to understand that if you make your access software accessible, it's easier to use, it's easier to test, and it's uh, it, it's actually it becomes easier to perpetuate, maintain, and and create future versions of it because you've instrumented your software now for uh, for ease of, of use, ease of development. Uh, if you shift left, if you do accessibility work earlier, say in the design phase where we always recommend it, you can have confidence early on that you're going to be inclusive, which increases revenue. You can also do the instrumentation in a way that we're all at Appium Conf right now, right? Appium, it was invented to help with mobile test automation, mobile test development. And at its fundamental core, it was invented alongside the ARIA attributes of uh, iOS, early versions of iOS and Android, where if you used ARIA and accessibility attributes, then it would make your product a whole lot easier to create test scripts against. Uh, your page object model is much easier to maintain, uh, that kind of thing. So you can address these bugs earlier, way before they make it into production and make your software easier to test against and easier to to do. And all, all along the way, you're also helping to build a more inclusive product for the open web. Go to the next one. Now, the, the next thing is that once you've tested your, your software against the, the phone that you have in your pocket or against an emulator that you're running on your desktop, you need to understand that accessibility is different for Android, it's different for iOS, and then for, especially for Android, you have a whole new set of devices you have to work with. So multiple manufacturers, Samsung, Google, Huawei, there's a whole bunch of companies making Android devices. And then there are multiple strains of operating systems that each one of them has. They they try to stay on a somewhat unified version, but they just don't. They're, they're forked versions, they're split offs, there's different versions being maintained by each one. And iOS is not all that different. They have a single lineage of devices, but they do have multiple uh, you know, form factors, multiple resolutions, which results in different screen sizes, different pixel uh, density, different all sorts of different attributes that make them difficult to keep up with, which means you as a tester are going to be on the hook for testing potentially hundreds or thousands of combinations of operating system and device and browser if you're on browser or native app if you're on uh, native app. So uh, we, we've also found that as time goes by, as the mobile market increases or increases in maturity, devices are being used for a longer time by people, especially by those who are, you know, a little bit on the older side, like myself. I think my phone's three years old. We keep we tend to keep a hold of these things because we don't want to upgrade. We don't want to change the new version. And especially if you're working in an industry like healthcare or um, you know hospital uh, insurance, something like that, uh, you're going to have users who are working with older devices, and you you need to keep those alive. Which means you need to have access to the iPhone seven, the iPhone eight, even though the world is on iPhone fourteen. So. Um, uh, not not to mention the fact that the monoculture of Apple devices, meaning there's one manufacturer that's creating all the devices, that same manufacturer is also creating the operating systems. Now, that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing in that Apple happens to have made the very nice choice to make their products a little bit more accessible by default than some other manufacturers. Um, they always think of it um, pretty early on in the process, and they make devices not only easier to use, from an accessibility standpoint, but also easier to develop with from an accessibility standpoint. Um, there was a colleague of ours uh, in the accessibility industry, Crystal Preston Watson, who works for Salesforce. And she's, she was very complimentary recently about the Apple Vision Pro and how it was able to take a monocular vision and work, even though it's intended for people with binocular vision to work with three-dimensional uh, objects, it still was able to handle uh, monocular vision quite well. Um, the thing is about that is that it is a good thing that they've done that. But what if at some point the next CEO or someone else in product design decides, ah, it's not that important. You know, we um, 
we are at risk when it's a, a basically a monopoly for them to make a different decision or to slowly degrade over time their focus on this. And so it's important for us to adapt it so thoroughly and and uh, take advantage of these features so consistently that they have no choice but to support it because they know how many people in their industry actually rely on these kinds of things. So we need to hold them accountable to maintaining this level of standard and maybe even raise it a little bit. Now, we should say that accessibility testing on emulators is a little bit challenging. Uh, talk back on an emulator is difficult. Uh, iOS voiceover it just flat out isn't available on simulators. Uh, and this will vary with more cl some cloud providers more than others. Some don't offer emulator simulator. But we, it is important to understand that these are challenges. Um, even though emulator simulator testing is a very good way to go, sometimes with accessibility, it can be a little bit different in how it works. And one thing in particular with uh, emulator simulator is you're not using the same input device like your your hands uh, in, in some cases to work with uh, an emulator simulator as you would be with an actual device. So you don't get the full breadth of experience that you do that a, a user um, who needs assistive technology would in order to get that. Um, and the other thing about this is this is not just applicable to accessibility, but uh, physical devices are difficult to and expensive to, to manage just across the board. And this applies to, I represent one of the cloud vendors we're talking about, but it really applies to all three of the four um, major sponsors of this conference that, that um, physical devices are e e expensive and difficult to manage. And we'll talk more about this in the next slide. Um, we just, we should talk more about how, how difficult it is to maintain a host of cloud devices. And I know that a lot of, uh, a lot of you are sitting uh, at a place right now where either in your home office or at the office that you go to every day, there's a stack of devices on somebody's desk, or there's a big rack of devices sitting somewhere and you have to go there and you have to grab, pull one device out of the rack. And it's probably got fingerprints on it from the last person who used it. And maybe they forgot to plug it in. So you have to plug it in and charge it. And then you, you boot the thing up and it, it's an older device. So you haven't booted it up in quite a while. And so you have to update the operating system. And now you're 45 minutes into trying to test your, your software and you haven't even gotten started yet to be able to install your app because you're, you're having to deal with this physical dusty device and and maybe maybe it has to stay plugged in because it's really really old and the battery is decaying and uh you know so you're really limited when you have to deal with that kind of thing even though i know a lot of folks here are dealing with that right now in fact i'd love to sound off in the chat right now if you're having to deal with a situation like that we actually had a a story from a bank in brazil where um there was a kid who had to go um load his backpack full of phones to drive to ride his bike between developer from one developer's house to another during the pandemic because they needed a certain set of phones to be able to be at this developer's house during a certain two hour time period so they could pull out a device test some stuff put the back the device back in and this kid had to ride his bike all over rio de janeiro to try to de deliver these devices because they couldn't afford to put devices on everyone's uh, everyone's desktop but the other thing is about it is that when you maintain your own device lab, not only are you um, making sure that your developers have to have each copy of the device, but you don't have the ability then to keep track of things like videos and logs and screenshots or you know boot and, and shut down emulators on demand. Uh, with real devices, you don't have to worry about puffy batteries and uh, making sure that they're they're always on or that that um, you know if somebody updates the operating system on an Apple device, they can't go backwards. So if somebody accidentally did that and you still need to reproduce a bug in an older version of the operating system, you have no choice. You're stuck with it. So, But with a cloud provider, you can actually go back in time. You don't have to worry about app storage uh, because we can we can host that for you. Um, we uh, the, the cloud provider can do things like biometric authentication, image injection, audio capture, all these different things, which you would have to reverse engineer and build these into your your uh, Selenium, uh, or sorry, your Appium grid if you were to maintain these things yourself. It's a lot of work. Um, to give you an idea of how much at work it is, we put together a timeline of uh, say the last couple of years. This is actually a real time period between 2023, 2024 of the different devices by the different manufacturers that have been released. And so each dot, the, the, the golden colored dots on the top that represents three different major releases from Huawei of actual devices that you would have to add those devices, buy them, put them on your grid. And then the browser versions, they get updated on each, each device, as well as the mobile operating system that gets updated between iOS and Android. Each little dot on here, Rachel and I call this the Skittle slide because it's a whole bunch of Skittles. Um, and 
each dot on this matrix represents, I'd say, two to X number of hours of work you have to do to maintain a device farm each time one of these things happen. And I know you probably sat there going, hey, Marcus, I don't have to, I, I maintain my own device lab and I don't have to do all that maintenance. Well, the truth is, if you're not doing this kind of maintenance, then you're missing out on browser updates and operating system updates and framework updates. And you're introducing risk into your process by not keeping up with all these things. And there are probably some security vulnerabilities like Log4j or something like that, which are making it into the the, the grid, which you are not keeping up with if you're not doing this maintenance. So you have two choices. You're either doing this kind of maintenance and you're spending huge amount of time and not one of those minutes has anything to do with testing your software and making sure it works for your users. That is wasted time. It's below the line work. If you aren't keeping up with all that maintenance, then you're introducing risk and missing things inside your infrastructure. So um, any, any of the cloud providers represented here uh, can help you with this. And I strongly urge you not to pursue this this kind of activity of maintaining your own device cloud. And yes, you want, unless you want to come work for one of these vendors, which is also not a bad idea, but you've got to decide what kind of business you're in. Do you want to help the users of the product that you're testing? Or do you want to just sort of go into a lab off to the side and uh, wonder vaguely what users are actually doing with your software? That's the choice. Let's go to the next one. Um, I think I've sort of already, already covered these. We could leave this slide as a leave behind, but essentially you've got huge amounts of overhead when you're uh, designing and, and maintaining your own device cloud. Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll we'll move on because we've got a, a little bit of an exercise in front of us we'd like to do. Yeah, let's go uh, ahead and dive into our exercise. So Rachel, I'm going to pretend that I am a head of engineering and I've got a project and I've just heard about this EAA and accessibility thing. And now I'm going, oh my gosh, I've got eight months to make my software uh, accessible. Um, I mean, it sounds like you've been doing some research into this space. Can you just give me kind of an idea of what it would take to uh, make my features accessible in my mobile app? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Marcus. So I'm a developer and then I heard about this too. And so I did take a look at this and, and want to kind of report back to you. I took about a day or so of, of research and testing out some things in our existing Appium scripts to see if that's a viable solution. Um, so I'd like to share that with you now. So, awesome. so what I kind of first did was just did a Google search for what are the top mobile accessibility issues. Um, and these days, Google has your, you know, your AI overview, AI is taking over. Um, so I saw, you know, some of the most common accessibility issues that Google pulled out with its AI is size-based in accessibility. So small buttons or links, or parts of the screen that are blocked can make apps difficult to use. And I was like, oh yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Like I've struggled with that personally. Like when something's really small on my phone, it's hard to interact with it. Um, so I looked a little bit more into that, that type of accessibility issue. So I did some more Googling about, I Googled, you know, what's a small, what small buttons in, in mobile app accessibility. And I got this article from Android accessibility. So I took a, a look at this, it says touch target size on any screen, you know, we want to be able to click and interact, and, and those elements should be uh, large enough. So they recommend uh, that our elements have a width and height of at least 48 dp. So I'm, a, I'm an Android developer myself, but I also you know, maintain our Appium scripts for, for, Android, for Android app. So this makes sense to me. You know, I'm thinking about 48 dp and what that looks like on an app, and that seems like a reasonable size. But I wanted to do, you know, a little bit more due diligence and look at some other some other resources here. So I kind of moved past this other Google one, and I saw this access guide provide buttons uh, with large target text tar target size. So I took a look at this article, um, and this one was was really referencing WCAG WCAG criteria, which. I had heard referenced as well when I was looking into the EAA specifically too. I, those two things kind of go hand in hand. My understanding is, you know, EAA is uh, relying on the WCAG guidelines that already exist today. So looking at this though, it's it's a little bit confusing to me because we're looking at um, pixels instead. So we're, we're saying 44 pixels, whereas Google was telling me, you know, 48 DP. So I was like, okay, I don't know. What, what should I look at here? Let me dive into this a little bit more. What, what exactly do we mean by pixels? I'm kind of guessing they're meaning, you know, CSS pixels from the web. Um, and so I'm not quite sure what, what, which reference I should go for. I think I probably should lean on, on 
WCAG, since that's what um, you know the EA EAA Act is is referencing. Um, so I think maybe 44 is okay, but is C does you know the CSS pixels translate directly to um, to DP or you know what, how do I make that conversion? So I tried to do a little bit of research there, and I ended up kind of just getting confused because there's a lot going on when it comes to pin, pe pixel density and there's just a lot of math and things going on. So I then I, I pivoted and, and took a look at our Appium scripts to see if I could kind of make an example and see if I could figure it out hands on. Um, so I, I, I created this demo screen here where I've, I've created some buttons that are intentionally not 44 by 44 or 48 by 48. Um, so this button in particular, the width satisfies that, but the the height is only like, you know, 40. It's not 44 or 48. Um, so that I, I was going to, you know, go ahead and write an Appium script to, um, to, to see how that works. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to copy and paste what I did instead of going a little bit more interactive with it. But um, <clears throat> essentially what I did in my Appium script was I... Uh, once I got to my touch target size screen there that I created my demo screen, um, I'm gonna you know click on that button and and try to get the size and see see what the size is, see what I'm working with in our Appium scripts. Um, and and actually I I had to write a function to kind of scroll to that screen because I was working with a different test app that already had a bunch of stuff in it. Um, and so I am getting the full window size up here. So I was kind of able to compare those two um, once I ran my test. On our um, on Appium, which is running on our cloud hosted devices, um, I was able to print out the size of my button, uh, and I got two forty eight and one oh five. But I'm looking at this one oh five. I'm trying to. I'm like, okay, I'm going to need to do some math here. So this is kind of the point where I I've reached a point where I was like, this is a lot, <laughs> you know. Like I just kind of dove into only the first thing that I saw as a potential area to dive into. So I think we're going to need a bit more help here than, you know, just what I can do on my own. Pretty what do you think, Marcus? Subject. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, it's a pr pretty intense subject. So I'm assuming that the sort of the open source libraries and some of the tools out there can help us. I believe so. Yeah. So um, one last thing I did want to show <laughs> here was the, the power of this is if I am able to, you know, write a test here, um, that text checks for that 48 by 48 or 44 by 44, whatever our business decides we want to test for, um, we would be able to test that on all of our devices on our on our platform um, cloud hosted. So I just wanted to show, you know, I was poking around on here. Um, I was able to run it on our cloud hosted devices and, and also get those values in here. So um, there is viability there. But yeah, I think a, a better option would be looking at tools that can help us with those nitty gritty calculations of the details of it. Um, so now let's pivot back into our presentation where now I'm gonna be Rachel who does know a lot about accessibility um, and just wrap us up here at the end and, and mention there's a few different accessibility tools out there for testing. Apple and Google have um, free tools that are available. So they have kind of more manual ones that you can interact with. Um, and then they also have tools that integrate into your Espresso and XUI tests which could also be run um, with Appium. So those are free ways to integrate accessibility testing. And then just small little plug, my company does have a paid offering. Check us out. I don't want to pitch or anything like that. But I'll give us uh, you know, one last statement from Marcus about accessibility overlays, because this is a, a topic that you'll hear a lot about um, in, in the news with accessibility. So I'll pass it over to you, Marcus. Yeah, just I would say avoid. I can't name the names, name the companies by name, but avoid overlay products. If someone tells you they've got some package that they can install in your software to instantly make it accessible, be skeptical. It's probably not true, and it will actually open you up to more lawsuits than if you do it the hard way. So let's talk about that in the Hangouts. We'll be there in just a few minutes, but uh, we'll leave this slide as a leave behind, and you can have links, link, click through the links on there when you get it. So great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Thanks a lot, Marcus. It was really insightful.